Hey, if you need help getting uh, yourself registered to vote, that's what the table out in the foyer is for. It's going to continue to be there. We are not going to tell you how to, where to put the X on your ballot and all that, but we will uh, give you some unbiased and, uh, uh, you know, voters' guides, and we can tell you how to find those as well. But I, I believe it's a sacred duty to us as, uh, as believers to, uh, to take part in whatever we can to influence our culture. So get yourself ready for that. And uh, you can pick up one of these booklets out there as well and get yourself registered to vote if you're not already registered to vote. So you got a card? All right. We're going to read it out loud. How about that? Everybody say out loud. Now say out loud, out louder. Okay. All right. Let's read it together. I'm going to put my... Uh, glasses on so I don't invent or add to God's word or take away from it. But let's, uh, let's read out loud together. We're going to read it two times. Here we go. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. God made a place for you, didn't he? Let's read it again. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. Father, we thank you that you really indeed, it's the reason Jesus came, the King of Kings came here to make a place for us in, in your home to make heaven our home and our future. We thank you for that, God. We rejoice in that. Lord, if there's anyone here that uh, isn't ready to step into that home, I pray this would be the day they open their heart to the King of Kings and allow him to become their Savior. But right now, Father, we get to lift our voices. We get to praise you together. And Father, we're excited about that. So receive our praises now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, let's sing loud. you guys this morning and sing to the Lord together. This 
This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you singing this morning because we know that God has been faithful in the past. He's going to be faithful now. We know in the future that he's got us. We're going to sing some new songs together with you this morning. Pray that it blesses you and hopefully you catch along as we continue to sing.
darkest day. praise you this morning and we hail you as our King God because you deserve it Lord Lord you've proven yourself so faithful and trustworthy God in our lives so many times Jesus so how could we not sing to you and worship you 
That's what we do this morning, Lord. We set aside this time. We prioritize it, Lord, so that we could hear from you, God, from your word, so that we could spend time with other believers and people that love us, God, and love you. So, Lord, I pray that this morning, as we spend some time together, God, that you would open our hearts, Lord, maybe calm our minds so that we could hear, Lord, not only just from you, but clearly from you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We give you the rest of this morning. Would you go before us now? We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Well, good morning. How are you guys doing? You doing good? Good morning. Appreciate it. So friendly. That's how refuge is. Um, if you're not doing okay, you're still in the right place, right? Amen. You're welcome here. Um, if you are new or I just haven't met you yet, my name is Katie, and I get to tell you a little bit about what's going on at Refuge before we continue with our service. Um, it's a great day to be here. Refuge is a person in Jesus. It's a place in this place, and it's the people. And you're here, so we are fulfilling that part of it. So thanks for being here. Um, we have some things going on, um, but first I gotta tell you, uh, you're here on a very special day. Um, it's a big event, and I'm not talking about something that has commercial breaks or a halftime show. Uh, I know if some of you are excited about that, you're wearing your colors proudly. Actually, it's the same color, isn't it? Just red and red, so it's hard to tell a little bit. Um, Anyway, uh, today we get to launch a new series into the book of Hebrews, and I've already heard this message. I am so excited for you. It's so good. Um, it's so good. So be excited that you are here today. Um, Pastor Jeff is teaching um, as we launch this series. Pastor Bill um, wrapped up the book of Acts last week, and it's just a really cool time to be here at Refuge. So let's talk about a couple things happening around around the around the family here. We have things happening all the time, but I want to highlight a few. Um, the first one is an opportunity to serve, and then the next things are kind of chances for you to get involved. So the first thing is um, if you are thinking about how do I get plugged in to Refuge, I want to encourage you to pray about, um, think about, talk to other people about joining children's ministry. A, yes, because we need you. But B, we really want people who feel called to love on God's kids and to um, teach them, to minister to their parents, to give them a little break so they can come enjoy service. Um, so if that is you, we would love to talk to you. Even if you're just interested, we'll find a place for you, whether it's teaching or organizing crayons and everything in between, all right? Um, so opportunities to get involved and just get connected with others. Um, the first thing I want to let you know about is a really cool ministry we have here at Refuge. If you're not already aware, it's called Refuge Recovery. And they meet every Monday and Friday. It's a fantastic way to start and end your week. If you are or you're a person who knows someone who struggles with addictions or strongholds, this group would love love, love to meet you and be there with you every step of the way. They're starting a new series um, coming up, so this is a fantastic time to get involved and give it a try. Um, happens right here at Refuge, and um, if you're hesitating, please don't. Just come, okay? Um, next thing um, is our Boomers and Beyond group. Again, they meet um, all the time, so we just wanted to highlight them to you. They meet the third Thursday of every month. If you're wondering, am I a boomer? Then probably not, because I think you just know. I think that's how it goes. Am I right? Am I right? Let's hear it for the boomers. If you're a boomer, that's right. Okay. Represent. Um, and if you're wondering where the mini chapel is, just come to Refuge and we'll help you find it. But basically, you go down the hall, past the bathrooms, and just hang a right and a very next quick right. Nope, not quick right. That's the prayer room. So no, you just keep going, and then there's you'll, you'll figure it out. You'll hear the boomers. You, you'll hear the boomers. They'll, they'll greet you. Um, and then finally, our first Refuge hike of the year is happening. Who likes to hike? Good outdoors. Um, not as much. Okay. Is that because all the boomers are here? No, boomers like to hike. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, they always mix it up on where they go. So this next location is Eaton Canyon Falls. The folks who lead this, they always test this with kids. So it's, it's kid friendly. Um, and also the people who test it are, I would say they're probably boomers themselves. So 
it's for everyone. Um, and if you are interested, I recommend um, letting them know that you're coming. That way they can expect you and, um, and just prepare for the group that's coming. So I think that is all. So since we always have a lot going on at Refuge, what I love to do is if you're involved in something other than coming on Sunday mornings, if you're a part of the Boomers group, if you serve in another way, when we greet one another, would you just ask the person like, hey, how else are you connected at Refuge? Um, that way we can just kind of do a little share time. You might learn about something happening here that you didn't previously know. Sound fun? Other people are like, I just want to say hi and sit down. You can do that too. You can totally do that too. Anyway, right, let's go ahead and stand up and ask someone how else you're connected at Refuge. y'all good morning good morning how you guys doing all right hey um wow 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 um i'm gonna try to do this without getting emotional but um when y'all sang all hail king jesus and the voices the image i got was like we're um we're not this isn't all the people that are going to be in heaven i'm pretty sure um <laughs> just not y'all. There's going to be way more people. And when in heaven we sing that song, all hail King Jesus and the voices that will, you know, just the woo, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like the, the visual image of, of King Jesus taking that throne, whatever that looks like for you. And, and all of us singing together, hail the King and, and every knee will bow because they'll know, oh my gosh, it was right. They were right all along, right? We were right with King Jesus. That will be an incredible moment, and praise God for Carissa, right, just demonstrating the heart of Jesus. I love it. I love it. And the rest of them, too, but just that moment, emotions are good, and sometimes I'll just say it. Um, I don't have time to say it, but I'm going to say it. Okay, so, so sometimes in, in music, um, God is the author of music, right? And music, like psalms, like poetry, hits differently sometimes than, than preaching and teaching, right? And we can get emotional during preaching and teaching, but songs and, and poetry uh, created by God will sometimes evoke emotional response. That's not why we do it for emotional response, but sometimes that happens, particularly in the area of worship, when we sing, sing all hail King Jesus in, in vocals and the, the church joins behind and if you get emotional in those moments that's okay it's not like it's contrived or somehow that's made up uh, it's just a different way that music hits it hits differently sometimes than the preaching of the Word of God and at times at times the preaching of the Word of God can cause us to be emotional I think some of the texts that we're gonna look at this morning is high-level emotional right but it, it, you might not cry and that's okay the reality is, I think God designed, he's the author of music, and so there's parts that God designed, like poetry, for it to hit differently for all of us and speak to us. So, amen? Yeah. Amen. That was not planned or in here, and we still have so much to get to. So let's pray, and let's dive in this morning. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for, Lord, your, your son. Lord, that we look forward to that day, that moment where we're in heaven before you and we're, we're singing together and praising together, all hail King Jesus. 
And on this side of heaven, Lord, we want to be people who are about your word, who are living for you, desiring relationship with you. And Lord, putting you above all else because you're worthy of that place. And so this morning, as we've, we've made it a point to be here at church on Sunday morning, desiring to hear from the living God, would you speak to us this morning? Um, by your word and by your spirit, Lord, would you guide and direct us? Uh, Lord, I would just ask that in, in, as we start the book of Hebrews, um, Lord, that we would just fall more in love with you. You are so worthy, so worthy, Lord, of our praise and adoration, our time. You're worthy of all things. So, Lord, be glorified in this place. Amen. Amen. Um, so we are starting the book of Hebrews. We, we left Acts last week, and we're moving on into a new book. So if you're brand new with us here this morning, hey, you came in a great time because we literally starting a book of the Bible to this morning. So uh, Hebrews chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Um, but let me ask you this. Is there anything in your life that you found, maybe it's a product or it's a name brand that you felt like, I will never veer from this. This is so good. This is the thing that I love, and I will never veer from this name brand or this, this sort of tool or, or this car brand. I'll never move off of it because in my mind, everything else is secondary. It's, it's a knockoff. Anybody have something like that in your life? Somebody this morning said, best foods mayonnaise. <laughs> like all other mayonnaise is second class. <laughs> um, I don't know what that is for you, that there's something that you're like, this is the thing. This is a, for, I, I did a little bit of a research on this. Um, there, there are Pringles. Some of you will have them at the Super Bowl party. And then there are Prongles. Always stick with the Pringles. Don't go with the Prongles. Uh, how about this? Like one of the, we had this little discussion in our office. Like what's one of those things that you just don't veer from? And, and it, it was their morning cereals. You don't veer off the name brand morning, morning cereals. So there's marshmallows and stars instead of Lucky Charms. And Crisp Crunch instead of Captain Crunch. You don't want to veer off the, the name brands. How about this one? Uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then there's the, the tortoise brands, right? I can almost guarantee as soon as you open that pack, that arm is going to fall right off. <laughs> Don't buy the tortoise brand. And this one is a little bit more personal with me. It hits close to my home for me. Uh, my mom's apricot pie that she makes made from the tree, her apricot tree in the backyard. There's no substitute. I mean, I've looked around, we've bought store-bought pies, we've tried everything, you've tried the, even canned apricots, not the same. There is one apricot pie, it's my mom's, and, and everything else is a, is a knockoff. Uh, I don't know what that is for you, but, but I want to tell you this, the author of Hebrews, his argument throughout his entire book is that there is nothing better than Jesus. Everything else is a knockoff. Everything else is secondary. He is the most important thing in all of the world. Nothing is better than him. In fact, some of you have seen uh, this sticker before. He is greater than I. Uh, the idea behind this is Jesus is greater than me. And some of you are like, oh, that's what that means. I've seen it all over the place. He is greater than... Got it, got it, right? So he is better than me. He takes the place of me and everything else in my life. Now, I would just say this. If the author of Hebrews was going to redo this uh, logo or this sticker or this t-shirt, here's what he would have said. He is greater than everything. He is greater than everything. Anything else that I would want to try to put in his place, he is greater than. That is the idea of all the book of Hebrews. Now, now, the question that many people ask, well, and it's hotly debated, and as soon as I ask it, you're going to be like, oh, I wonder who thinks. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? And if you wonder, and you're like, I do wonder, or I have an opinion, you're, you're the Bible scholar, and that's great, uh, but there's, it's hotly debated, is it not, Bible scholars? So who do you think wrote it? Don't, no, no, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. 
Many people believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Some of you don't think he did. Uh, But even Bible scholars go back and forth on who is the author of the book of Hebrews. I want to give you the list of people that have been suggested that wrote the book of Hebrews. There's Paul, Apollos, Barnabas, Luke, Priscilla, Jude, Philip, Silvanus. Now, we don't want to spend a ton of time talking about this because I could just sum it all up with this. After reading the book of Hebrews, here's the, here's the common ground I think we could all find, depending on whoever you think wrote it. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspired it. He's the one who guides and directs whoever decided to author the book or whoever God decided to author the book. The Holy Spirit is behind it. I think in the first few verses that we're going to look at this morning, you'll come to that same conclusion that God is behind writing of the book of Hebrews. Now, here's the other question. And I think this is super important for us. Who was it written to? Who did the author of Hebrews write this to? And I will tell you this. He wrote it to Jewish Christian believers. Jewish Christian believers. Those that had put their faith in Christ. But, but, listen, this is important. We're wrestling with maybe going back to Judaism again. That they were wrestling with the fact that their moms and dads were still attending synagogue. That they'd grown up in the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition with the, with the sacrifices and all the things that went along with it and the special feasts. And they were wrestling back and forth and they were asking the question, is Jesus really better? Is Jesus really more important than my family and my heritage and my tradition? And, 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 and listen, listen, and I'm really struggling with it. And so the author of Hebrews says, I want to reach that person. I want to give clarity to who Jesus is. And maybe there's a moment in your life, maybe you're there now, where you're wrestling with your past and you're wondering, is Jesus really worth it? Well, I'm glad you're here this morning because, and throughout the book of Hebrews, this is one of his major statements that Jesus is better than everything. He is better than everything. There's, a, there's another group that's kind of mentioned within the book of Hebrews, and it's those people that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus and, and are actually just following Judaism. And, and he's going to make a, a handful of times, he's going to make an argument to them that Jesus is better than anything that you've found in Judaism. That Jesus is better than anything that you will find in any other religion or any other way of life. Jesus is better. And maybe you're here this morning because you're like, I'm just checking this whole church thing out. I'm just trying to get a read and a feel. And, 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 and hopefully this morning, my prayer all week has been that, that you would come to find out that Jesus is better than anything that you're placing your hope or your faith or your trust in. Jesus is worthy, worthy of your praise and your adoration. In fact, many of you would say Jesus is worthy of my entire life. I've, I've given everything to him. And so I want to tell you this morning, those who he's written it to, so if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, and let's, let's get this thing kick-started here, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and we're only going to go through three verses this morning, and yet it will take our entire time. So <laughs> three verses this morning, look with me at verse one. Here's what it says. Hebrews chapter one, verse one, near the end of your Bible, if you're having a hard time getting there, uh, closer to the end of the Bible. Hebrews chapter one, verse one. Here's what it says. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Stop right there. This is super important. I wanted to point this out to you. Three things real quick. Number one, God spoke. God spoke. That's significant. I think if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a Bible reader, we can oftentimes get complacent with this idea that in fact, the creator of all things, he spoke. And who did he speak to? His people, his creation. Why? Because he desired relationship with them. Think about it for a second. He doesn't have to. He could have just created everything, turned the little clock and said, just go. Just live out your life. But he doesn't. Instead, he steps down in and says, I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to guide them. And I'm going to direct them. Why? Because he's a personal God who desires relationship with his people. Which, by the way, is why we have a Bible reading program here at Refuge. Why we take the Bible seriously. Why we encourage 
you and us to read the Bible because we believe that God speaks to us through his word. No different than the God that did all the way back in the garden with Adam and Eve who desired relationship with Adam and Eve and spoke to them. He desires to speak and have relationship with us. And so this next week, if you don't have one of these already, pick one up. It's on the way out. It's our Bible reading program for the entire year. We're in week seven. We're going to be in Acts chapter 15 starting tomorrow. If you haven't been with us or you need to catch up, catch up and spend time in his word. Here's why. God speaks to us. God desires relationship with us. And so he gives us his word by which we can know him and learn about him and grow in him and be led by the spirit. Now listen, God spoke and it says here, look what, at various times and what? Various ways with the fathers and the prophets in the past. Now think about this for a second. He didn't just choose one direction or one way to speak. He used a plethora of many ways and many voices, many different types of, of ways that he spoke to his people. Uh, audible voice. He actually used his audible voice at times. We'll see that in the Old Testament. He used walking in the garden and having a relationship with Adam and Eve. He used visions like he did for Ezekiel. Uh, he used a cloud as he led his people through the desert. He used a donkey. He used a burning bush. You're getting the idea. He used angels. He used a still, small voice with Elijah. He used judges and kings and prophets, all to speak to his people. Various times in various different ways. Now listen, this is significant. He did this in the past. This is what the author of Hebrews is saying. He says, in the past, at various times, he spoke to our fathers through the, the prophets. And this voice was heard. But he's done something, listen, in 2 Peter. This is actually what it says. 2 Peter 1.20. Knowing the first that the prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but, the holy, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by who? the Holy Spirit. So we know that as the prophets are speaking, they were being moved by the Holy Spirit, that God is actually directing them to speak to his people and to his creation. Listen to this one. You know this one. 2 Timothy 3.14, Paul talking to Timothy, and here's what he says. But you must continue in things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now that for Timothy was what? What, the Old Testament or the New Testament? Old Testament, right? You've known the Old Testament, Timothy, from when you were little, which are able to speak to you, make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, Timothy, is given by inspiration of who? Of God of God speaking into life and is profitable for doctrine and reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now listen, this is so important that when we look at the scriptures and we look at the Old or New Testament, we know that God is speaking these things into existence. He's using human authors by the power of the Holy Spirit to write the words of God. Now why would he do that? I believe it's because he desires, like we read already, he desires relationship with you, so he speaks, and he directs us, and he guides us along. Now, look with me back at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 again. Look what it says. God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, look at verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by who? His Son. Now, what's he just done here? He's moved us from the past into what? These last days. In other words, there's been a clock that's been set that we are now not in the past anymore, but we're in what the Bible is defining as these last days. You and I currently are living in the last days. Now, what was the signifying mark that, dig, that set apart the past from the last days? Somebody help me. One name. Jesus, the coming of his son, came and he said, in these last days, 
In the days that you're living in and I'm living in, in the days that the author of Hebrews was writing, he's saying, you are in the last days. And here how is how he's speaking to us today. In the past, prophets, right? In the, in the past, a, a burning bush. In the past, visions and, and all these things. But today, he narrows it all down to one person. He has spoken to us by his son, Jesus. That's significant. Because all of a sudden, what the author of Hebrews is saying, and what we've been saying all morning, is Jesus is significant. In fact, he's better than all the prophets. He's better voice to listen to than all the different various means and ways God spoke in the Old Testament. Because now you have his son living and dwelling with you in these last days. Listen, you and I are both living in these last days. We're living in a time where the Old Testament people, prophets, they were all waiting. When are you going to come, Lord? When are you going to send the Christ and the Messiah? We're, we're anticipating and waiting. In fact, here's what, second, here's what 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says. He says, of this salvation, the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, the coming of Jesus, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. In other words, when is all this going to happen? You've made these prophecies and promises about the coming of Christ. When's it all going to happen? And they were all waiting. But listen, in the last days, in the days you and I are living in, we know he came. Look what else he says. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Listen, you and I are privy to this information that we know who Jesus is and that we're living in the last days. And here's the question. Are we listening to him? Are we seeking after a relationship with him? And the author of Hebrews, I believe God inspired, is saying, listen to him, the son of God. He is worthy of your attention and for us to live lives with him and for him. Look what it says here in Matthew 5, 17. Here's what Jesus says. Do not think that I came to destroy the law and prophets. I didn't dis- come to destroy those past things. What did he come to do instead? I did not come to destroy, but what? To fulfill. Jesus is the fulfillment of all those voices that were speaking from the past. And he says, Jesus' own words, by the way, that's important. Jesus' own word says, I've actually come to fulfill. Look what this says, the woman at the well. You remember the woman at the well? And she's having this conversation with Jesus. And here's what she says. I know that the Messiah is coming. She says, I know, I believe the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. Listen to what her anticipation is when he comes. When he comes, he will tell us what? All things. I mean, in, in these, these last days, there's a Messiah coming that will tell us all things. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, what? Am he. I'm here. We are in the last days. I've come to speak for the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I've come to speak as God walking amongst you. I've come to tell you these things. And the author of Hebrews is saying, If you even want to try to make an argument that anything is better than Jesus, go for it, (laughs) right? There's no possible way we have that voice of God right here amongst us, coming to dwell amongst us. Now, some have argued in the past, well, well, maybe Jesus, just like in other religions, maybe Jesus is, is a prophet. Maybe he was just a prophet. He was one of the voices that God used to speak to his people, right? Maybe, maybe he was just a good teacher. Maybe he just could really just kill it, right, in teaching. Like, wow, amazing. What an incredible teacher. The Bible says he taught like no one we've ever heard. Maybe, maybe that's it. In fact, C.S. Lewis, uh, and some of you have heard this before, out of Mere Christianity, which is an incredible book. But uh, C.S. Lewis once said, uh, and this is his own words, 
out of mere Christianity. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept, they say this, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say, according to Lewis. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell himself. He must, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with some patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, nor did he intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a demon. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to come to accept the view that he was God. Now, here's the thing. Lord, lunatic, liar, right? He's one of the three, according to Lewis. He, he, and he would make the argument that he, he's not a lunatic because he put semblances together and awesome sentences and amazing teachings and people's lives were changed. It didn't seem like he was crazy, right? Is he a liar? Are the, the, the claims of deity that he make uh, made, is he a liar because of that? And, and, and C.S. Lewis comes to the idea that it doesn't seem like his moral character allowed him to be a liar, lacking integrity and character. So coming to the conclusion that in fact he was Lord or is Lord. And that's what Hebrews is saying. He's saying, listen, I want you to know who Jesus truly is. In fact, in our last two verses, he's going to give us seven things that tell us exactly who he is. And so if you would, look at uh, verse, the second part of verse 2 with me. It says, has in these last days spoken to us by his son and listened about his son. Number one, here we are. Whom he has appointed what? Heir of all things. Catch that. Heir of all things. Of all things. What do you mean all things? I mean like all things. Physical, spiritual, heaven, earth, all things. All, all things that he has created. He is the heir of all things. Now here's why that's significant. He owns all things. He has authority over all things. And, and here's why that looks like. Uh, if I were to come to your house tonight, and uh, to watch the Super Bowl, because you all invited me to come over. Thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll be at everyone's house. Uh, I just like chips and dip. That's all I really like. So just guacamole on the side is great. No, no big deal. If I were to come over to your house, and I were to start taking pictures of the things in your house, and I would take pictures, and I'd take pictures, you'd probably ask me, what are you doing? Like, why are you taking pictures of things in my house? And if I were to tell you I'm taking pictures and I'm selling them on eBay so I can make a bit of a profit before I leave today, you would say, no, stop. Why? Because these are my things. I own these things. They're not your things. You don't have authority or power over these things. These are my things. In the same sense, all these things belong to who? To Jesus. He says, I am, he's the heir of all things. He has authority and ownership over all things. That's significant. Why? Because he's made some promises to us as followers of, of Jesus. He, he gives us the hope of heaven. He promises to be with us. He promises to, to, to bring us into his presence at the end of all time. And if he's not authority over those things, in other words, if he's only partially heir of some things, right, then we can't rely on those promises, but the fact that he is heir of all things allows us to have confidence as followers of Jesus that we will be with him. Take a look at this in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Listen to this. In the context of Jesus being heir of all things, power and authority over all things. Then the seventh angel sounded, this is uh, Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voice, voices in heaven saying, 
The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and how long? Ever. Now, that promise only matters if Jesus has the authority to make that happen. And it says, according to our text, he is heir of all things, the heavens and the earth, time and space, all things. Now, check this out. Romans 8, 16, it says this is good news for those that follow after Christ. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then what? Then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with who? Christ Jesus. Now, you don't ever become Jesus. Can I get an amen? You don't become Christ. You become joint heirs with him who is the Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be what? glorified together. Now that only matters because he's the heir of all things. He's got power and authority. And last one, Romans eleven thirty six, 36, for of him and through him and to him are what? All things to whom be glory forever. Amen. All things belong to him. He has power and authority over all things. Now let's move on. Whom he has appointed heir of all things. Listen to this one, our second one for this morning. Through whom also he made the worlds. Now, the idea here, there's the idea of cosmos. That's the physical and material. And then there's another Greek word called ion, which is the idea of time and space. This idea of worlds is ion, time and space and all things material, everything. He's the creator of everything, heavens and earth. Look what he says here. He he is the creator of all those things. Now we see this time and time in scripture. Look what it says here, Colossians 1.16. For by him, all things were created that were in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. You mean God created the things of the spiritual realm? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him. And what's that second part? For him. You getting the idea here that he's better than the prophets? That that God sent in the last days his son, and this son has more significance than the prophets? Absolutely. Listen to this, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was who? was God. Who's the word here? Jesus. Jesus. Part of creation with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit at the very beginning. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Amen? Amen? That's incredible. He's better. I don't know what else to tell you right? We serve a God who created all things. He sends his son to walk on the face of the earth, and he says, listen to him. Follow after Jesus. He's better than anything that you want to try to put in his place. He's better than anything maybe this morning that you have put in his place. And if you're searching, if you're wondering what the significance of life is all about, and you're wondering, God, what am I even here for? Maybe you're not even saying, God, you're wondering, what am I here for? I hope this morning that you're seeing that Jesus has come and he says, listen, I've created all things. I have power and authority Over all things, I'm the heir of all things. And I'm worthy of your attention. I'm worthy of your praise. I'm worthy of your life being lived for me. He goes on, number three. He's the brightness of the glory of God, who being the brightness of his glory. Now, here's the thing that's significant about this. You and I, we're reflectors of the brightness of God. We we can reflect God's glory. Uh, as if uh, the sun hits us and we reflect the sun's light. What he's saying here is, is he's the, he is the radiance of God's glory. In other words, Jesus is the originator of that light. He's not just reflecting the light of God. He is God reflecting and radiating that light. We are mere reflections of God's light. He is God's glory and his light on the face of the earth. Here's what it says in John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, what did he say? 
I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Those are Jesus' own words. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, Whose minds the God of this age has binded. In other words, they can't see. They're, they're spiritual, living in spiritual darkness. Have, they can't see the, the glory of God. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Christ is shining that light upon them. He goes on. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in what? The face of Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who's radiating the glory of God's light, the brightness of the Lord. And you and I, listen, as followers of Christ, we reflect it. Amen? We're reflectors of that light. Look at what else he says. He says this in, in the back end of verse 3. And the express image of his person. The expressed image of his person. Now, some of you probably have never used one of these before, and I am with you on this. I have never melted wax in order to make an imprint. But the idea that the author of Hebrews is talking about here has this idea. In, in, he is the imprint or the image of the living God, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, here on the face of the earth. He is that imprint upon us. He's the exact, by the way, exact image of God living amongst us. Here's something else that's significant in this. Uh, he uses the word person there. And, and the idea of person there has the idea of a substance or essence. He, he is the essence of, of the living God, the Godhead living amongst us. Now here, again, this is why that's significant, is you and I are of one essence, we're human essence. We're made up of human stuff, for lack of a better... That's scientific. I think that's scientific. <laughs> We're human stuff, right? And human stuff never becomes God's stuff, right? It's, it, it's just not, it just doesn't happen because we're of one personhood. We're, we're made of one substance. Angels and demons, they're made of a different substance. They're, they're, they're of the spiritual realm, and they're made of something different than, than we're made of, and they're made of something different than God is made of. In this idea of personhood or substance or essence, there's only one deity. There's only one God that's made up of that sort of substance. And you and I will never be made of that. And angels and demons will never be made of that. God is uniquely made of that one substance. Now, I know that's rough terms because we don't believe in God being made. He's not made, but he's made of that essence or made up of that. I'll just leave it there. I'm looking for another word. Uh, he is of that one essence. Now, here's why, again, that's significant. That essence comes and dwells amongst us. And what he's saying in the text is that he is the exact essence of the Godhead. And he's dwelling amongst y'all and me. He's dwelling amongst uh, the essence of manhood. That's significant humanhood, right? That's significant that God comes and dwells amongst us. And that's what that says. He's the expressed image of his person. He moves on and we move on. It says this in the fifth, oh no, Colossians 1.15. We have time for it. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Colossians 1.19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Colossians 2.9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I mean, that's worth the price of admission right there, is it not? That you, I mean, you just take that picture and you say, wow, that's who Jesus is? He's better than anything. He's better than everything. The fact that God comes and dwells amongst us. Here's what John says in 14.9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And if it's sufficient for us, Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip. Please, Lord, I just want to see God. I just want to open up the heavens just a little bit. I just want to peek in and see him. And he says, Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen who? The Father. 
Jesus puts himself on the level of God and, and because he is. And so let's, let's move on here. Uh, our fifth one. It says, upholding all things by the word of his power. That literally means that he is sustaining life, that he's carrying it forward. It's not necessarily the image of like the earth is falling down and he's lifting it up, right? The idea is that he's carrying life forward, his plans. The, by the way, the plans of the one who ha- is the heir of all things, who has power and authority to make sure what he wants to have happen, happens. He's got that kind of power. It's all his. And he says he's sustaining life. He's carrying it forward. He's upholding it by what? The word of his power. Oh, you mean the word that created time and space? That created all things? That word that could speak into existence both you and me and the worlds around? That word is also carrying forward his will and his plan and his desire. He's sustaining all things, upholding all things by the power of his word. And I, I laughed at myself a little bit this week, and it's like, and Jeff, you want, your, you want to do it your way, <laughs> right? You want your plans? Instead of saying, oh, okay, I want to trust in God's ways, right? In his plans, in the one that created all things and sustains all things by the power of his word. His way is better. Can we all agree with that? Right? So let's look to him. And, and again, why Jesus is so significant is that he's saying, Jesus is the one who's upholding all things by the power of his word. He was at creation. He has power and authority over all things. And we look to Jesus and say, God, what would you have us do? Where would you have us go as you uphold all things by the power of your word? Look at number six. So number six is that he, when he had by himself purged our sins. The idea of purged there is, is cleansed or washed. And I think we talk about this frequently here at Refuge. Amen? It's one of the things we love most about Jesus is that he set us free from our sins. That, that actually this Jesus who comes to earth is the only way that we are set free from our sins. Now, what's interesting to me about this is as we've, we've read about like, oh, he created all things. He sustains all things. He's got power and authority to make all things happy. Here's what's, uh, ha- all things happen. Here's what's so significant to me about this. He's also the one that dies on a cross, rose again from the dead, and set us free from our sins. That that not only is the God who wants to talk with us and communicate with us and have relationship with us, is not only the God who created all things, but he's also the God who dies on a cross for you and I. And here's why. He's the only one that could. The, the perfect sinless son of God is the only one who could die on the cross for our sins and set us free. Here's why. The Hebrew author says, back in the past, you used to sacrifice animals, blood atonement for your sins. And, and you had to do that all the time, all the time, all the time. Jesus comes and he pays one penalty, one sin for all time because he could, because he's God. Now, here's what it says, and we'll get to this later on in Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm not going to dive deep into this, but Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, here's what it says. But this man, that's Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, how long? Forever. You mean paid for my sins? Forever? And ever, yes, that's what Jesus did in that one moment where he dies on the cross and he pays that sin. Sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made a footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Listen, that's you and me. Those are the people that have put their faith in Christ. Listen to what it says, because I want you to catch this. Don't miss this. For by one offering, the death on the cross... He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, those that have put their faith in Christ. He's saying, I got you. Don't go back to your family and start sacrificing animals again. Blood atonement, blood atonement. Don't go back. Jesus is the better way. He's the only way. In fact, it says this, but the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us. For after he had said had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. And he adds, 
their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That's incredible. The fact that the the living God comes and dies on the cross and he says, I'm going to pay your sins now and forever in this one moment. And I'm not going to remember your past anymore. I'm going to set you free from your past. And when you come before me, you don't have to come and, and, and apologize and apologize and apologize for all the things you did in the past because I will remember them no more. Instead, when you put your faith in Jesus, you will come to me and I'll call you son or I'll call you daughter. You're a child of God, co-heir with Christ as we read earlier. And I'll see you one day here with me in heaven. And until that day, I'll walk with you. I'll indwell you by my Holy Spirit. That's incredible news. Amen? That's incredible news. And let's look at our last one, our our seventh one this morning. And I'll tell you why that is significant. It says, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is out of Psalm 110.1. And here's what I would just tell you. Here's why it's significant, is that you serve a God who's not dead. In other words, there was a moment where he died on a cross, and he was buried for three days, but then he said it rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, so he's alive, and it says that he sits in a place of power and authority. In fact, it says sits at the right hand of God on the, as a majesty on high. In other words, he sits in a place of authority which we've already kind of looked at this morning. He's the heir of all things. And so I want to encourage you, when you come to know Jesus and walk with him, you're not serving a God or a prophet that's dead. You're serving a God who is alive and in the world and at work within the world, establishing his kingdom upon the face of the earth. And he's using people like you and me to speak into the the world around us, the darkness around us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, I want to read the verse and then just to get you excited about next week. Look at verse four. I'm not even going to talk about it. I promise. I will not say one word. But I want you to read it and then we'll dive more. In fact, chapter two of Hebrews, one and two, dives more into this. So look at verse four. Having become so much better than the angels, has he, has inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. I just want to leave you with that so you can see like, oh man, t- next week we get to establish the fact that he's even better than anything in the spiritual realm. Now here's my hope for you this morning. Um, may- maybe you are someone who- who's holding on to the things of the past and, and-, and maybe you- in your mindset, it's like, ah, is Jesus really better? Like I- I'm kind of in between two things here and I'm trying to hold on to both of them. I'm trying to hold on to Jesus in my life and all these things I just want to do from the past. And I would encourage you with this. After reading what we read this morning, How could you think that, right? Am I right? I mean, heir of all things, creator of all things, sustainer of life, forgiver of sins. I mean, there's nothing better than Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. Nothing better than Jesus. And maybe this morning you're here and you're like, well, I've heard of Jesus and I've been to church before. And and, and actually, I've never heard Jesus before talked about the way that the author of Hebrews was writing about Jesus. He seems pretty significant. And, and maybe I would encourage you to, to take a deeper look on who he is or have a conversation with someone about who Jesus truly is as, as Hebrews lays this beautiful image or vision of who Jesus truly is. And I would say one more person. Um, maybe it's someone who, who's been to church, they grew up in the church, and they kind of walked away, and, and they thought they were walking away from the church and all the stuff that goes on inside the church, uh, but maybe what you would discover after listening to this is that maybe you walked away from Jesus, and, and you loved Jesus, and you knew who Jesus was, and when you get reminded about this, that it's not just about church, I think the church is significant and important, but actually life is about a relationship with Jesus, And maybe this morning it's hitting you like, I I walked away from the wrong thing. I I walked away from church and I really ultimately walked away from Jesus. And when I look to see who Jesus is, heir of all things, creator of the worlds, 
sustainer of life, forgiver of sins. I, I want to know that Jesus more. I want to know that Jesus again. And I would pray for you this morning. And in fact, that's what we're going to do right now. Would you guys stand with me? And Lord, as we come to you this morning, we're going to lift up right now. We're just going to lift up people to you, maybe that we know uh, that aren't walking with you. Maybe there was a season of life where they did when they're youth or, or, and they've walked away. And, and really, they thought they were walking away from, from people or the church or the, the, whatever it was. But Lord, what they ended up doing is walking away from you. And, and we read this morning who you are. Those seven things, those seven powerful statements about who you are. And Lord, we want to pray for them right now to walk back with you again, to come back to relationship with the living God again through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Lord, I know that you come with open arms, ready to receive them, ready to have that conversation, ready to be open to receiving them back into your family again. Lord, we also want to, want to pray for those, maybe we're going to hang out with them today at the Super Bowl party or whoever that don't know you at all. They've never understood Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the power of who you are. And so, Lord, today, Lord, would we be lights for you and would we maybe even just open up that dialogue or conversation because we know how significant you are, Lord. We know how significant you are in the times past and now in these last days. Lord, you are speaking through your son. We know how significant you are, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, use us powerfully as your church on the face of the earth, your people on the face of the earth. Use us powerfully for the gospel. And may we as Christians be encouraged this morning to know that we're not following a prophet or a religion. We're following after Jesus. We're following after Jesus. Jesus, the name above every name. He is worthy of it all. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. Why don't we all sing this together before we leave? Sing all hail King Jesus. Oh, hail. thankful that you guys came this Sunday and spent it with us. Amen. Yeah, we can clap. <laughs> if you need prayer this morning, come up front. Communion as well off to the side. God bless you guys. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.